This spring and summer had several releases that I took my family to and did reviews for. Maybe it's just my phase in life and all these kids, but I tend to catch more stuff that's family oriented. Also, I'm a big fan of video games and people who obviously don't play them think they're only for children. Grab a box of Kleenex, I'll talk about a studio called Telltale. So I've got this enormous pet peeve for these gatekeepers of maturity who think they're above children's material and only consume adult content. Nope, not. Not that adult content, but sometimes it does border on it. The ironic thing in all of this is I find so-called children's material to usually contain better stories because they don't have the crutch of adult content. Mostly what makes a thing adult is the inclusion of a bunch of sex, drugs, and gratuitous violence because all other themes and devices can and are applied in less mature media. Almost always this is a crutch that is not used in a creative way, but as a shock tactic to make us think this stuff is cool. Do you think that smoking drugs is cool? Do you think that doing alcohol is cool? I saw a meme one time that when you're younger, you think coffee is the really cool grown-up drink. And then you become a teenager and you think alcohol, that's the adult drink. But then when you grow up, you realize it's water. Water is the real adult drink. Well, I think I'm old enough to tell you that the themes running through most so-called children's stories are the real adult stories. The folks that claim they don't read or watch these types of things are ironically displaying some of the most juvenile behavior imaginable. Ooh, great job. You're old enough to buy your own cigarettes. Nobody cares, honey. So YouTube's working out, but it's kind of weird because I got an email a few weeks ago from a company that I won't name, and they're like, hey, if we send you a thing, would you review it on camera? And I had never owned a thing of this type, so my review would mean basically nothing, so I declined. But then I get an email from this company called Flexispot asking me to talk about a standing desk, and I'm wondering why does this company name look so familiar, and then it dawns on me, it's because I already own two of them. So I feel like I'm cheating because I convinced these people to sponsor this video, and all I gotta do is tell you about a product that I already researched and bought for my personal use. This is the easiest job ever. So last year, my wife wanted a standing desk to do her makeup at so she didn't have to get up over and over again to grab other makeup or respond to child emergencies, which are never actually emergencies. I did a bunch of research and I landed on this guy. This is the E8, comes in white and bamboo. This was the best value and had all the features I wanted without the crap that I didn't. I absolutely love the front facing USBs, especially the type C on the end that charges my phone super fast. You got multiple preset positions with digital height display and child lock. One of her must haves was a drawer. This is my drawer of shame right here. Hers looks a lot better than mine. So I got her one, it was super easy to put together, and then I was immediately jealous and bought a second one for myself. They have a lot more uses than just a home office. Check out the links below, and a big thanks to Flexispot for sponsoring this video. So let's break down these adult crutches, okay? Starting with sex! Sex is almost never, ever, ever pulled off correctly. Is it fun? Absolutely! I've made a lot of kids. Obviously, I'm a big fan. <laughs> The actual act on screen or on page takes up time and doesn't move the story forward. The events leading up to or after sex can be dramatic. That can move a story. Sex is the motivation for a lot of human history, after all. But spending time actually doing it is usually a waste of the audience's time. You want to see the story develop, and all of a sudden they want to show you stuff, and you're like, Titties, yes, I remember. Patrick Rothfuss wrote this really great novel called The Name of the Wind, but I do not recommend that you read it because the sequel really isn't as high a quality and that sequel was released 12 years ago with no sign of the third book ever being released, so I don't want you to get invested. I'll talk about Mr. Rothfuss in another video in the near future, but for now I want to talk about that second book called The Wise Man's Fear. In that book, we see the main character grow in popularity, power, and for some reason, sexual prowess. Yes, in the second book, our hero is a powerful wizard who acts accidentally falls into the Fey realm and meets the Fey deity of sex. She is the absolute best at it. She teaches him all the moves. They do it. A lot. Then he escapes the Fey realm and proves his knowledge by immediately doing it with a barmaid. Also, he meets a tribe of mercenaries who are polyamorous and he bangs many of them. A large portion of the story is about how great he is at the sexing and how much he's doing it. Frankly, it's boring. The story comes to a halt multiple times so he can hop in the sack and not one time does it move the story forward. In fact, the sexual tension between him and the one character he isn't humping is the most interesting interesting relationship in the book. 
Hmm. Having heard about his newest novella coming later this year, that's not the end of the trilogy, that's just a side project he's procrastinating with, I decided to check out his previous novella from a decade ago called The Slow Regard of Silent Things. And it is really, really enjoyable, actually, except for the part where the main character goes for a swim. She takes her dress off. She's naked. She's in her all together. The stone and the water are cold on her nethers. She's nude. As she dips down into the water, she crosses her arm over her bare breast. We get it, Pat! She don't have any clothes on! Seriously, bro, rub one out before you start writing, if you ever start writing again. Hemingway advised people to write while drunk. Well, some guys need to write while empty. I'm thirsty. Another fantasy author that actually keeps a schedule, Brandon Sanderson, recently released his secret project number three. And in the book, he plays around with these two virgin 19-year-olds who are thrust into a stressful situation together and it involves a little bit of nudity. Rather than just smash them together like Barbie dolls, he uses the awkward situation to create tension for both characters and reveal things about them. I'm using an example from a book I haven't finished and I really hope this doesn't come back to haunt me once I finish the video. It did not come back to haunt me. This book is so good, you guys. Drugs can support a story in some cases, such as like a Scanner Darkly or anything Philip K. Dick really, but he doesn't focus on the drugs even in that story because he knows that's not the interesting part. This might just be a personal thing, but I really hate high characters, especially stoner characters. They overact the whole thing. The dialogue is dumb. Stoned characters are just annoying. Smoking doobies. Doobie Brothers, I was smoking doobies with my brothers. Sometimes you might see a coked up character work because they're they're all amped up and they're driving the action with their impulsiveness, but that's usually countered because the character has no agency and the fallout from their actions is usually really stupid. Plus most drug stories are wildly dramatic and they involve a bunch of crime in the seedy underbelly of the gritty and dark city. Maybe I'm in the minority on this one, but I just don't find drugs to be interesting in concept or in practice. Yeah, I tried them in high school. It was very okay. Violence is the only one that can be gotten away with some of the time. However, it's often overused. You'll see horror movies and action movies using it not to accent what's going on, but to pad the thing with shock value. I'm not fully opposed to violence on screen. It's just that I have a lot more respect for a storyteller that can deliver the feeling and emotional impact of it without having to show it. That's a higher skill, in my opinion. I was very impressed with that on The Last of Us. What they did not show was just as important as what they did. Saw was really guilty of this. It actually kicked off an entire genre of torture movies. It didn't have a plot, just increasingly creative and gross ways of torturing people to death. That was a strange time in cinema. Saw attempted to justify itself with this message about like appreciating your life or whatever, but really it was just perverse for its own sake. Human Centipede was the same way. These movies aren't good by any standard at all. They're just shocking. It's a pizza cutter. All edge, no point. The biggest issue is most of us don't relate to these subjects and the emotions surrounding them. Like sex is usually portrayed in this dramatic and forbidden fashion. Sorry, I can't relate. I actually keep a list of all the people I've had sex with. It's called my marriage license. <laughs> And there's just no drama in my sex life other than the kids seem to have like this internal alarm that goes off when it's happening. So them rattling the door right in the middle, that does add tension, but not the kind that makes a good story, you know? Most people don't have tawdry sex lives. And even though they might fantasize about it from time to time, those stories just don't make the same connection. Similarly, drug use is not so rampant that it resonates with most of the audience. And not only that, but drug use on screen is usually dramatic and in a violent setting, which most drug users aren't in. A lot more people actually do coke than you might think, but they're not doing it in the bathroom at Club 54 or in their corner office before the AVN merger goes down or or something. I haven't seen all of that show yet. You might know people that do drugs. They're just not living the dramatic junky lifestyle of most shows and movies. Now, we should be fair and admit that sometimes sex, drugs, and violence open up creative avenues that free up a project. Deadpool would not be nearly as funny if it couldn't have the over-the-top silly violence. The director of Logan has stated the R rating was very important important because telling the story of old man Logan would have been hampered by the rules of PG-13, and I agree. John Wick wouldn't seem as dangerous if he wasn't killing 200 people per film. Uh, train spotting, basketball diaries, those stories would be 
kind of impossible to tell without the drugs. I find the best use of drugs is when they're an allegory for the concept of addiction in general, which everyone can relate to in varying degrees. The drugs just provide a convenient physical focus for that idea. The point here is that the adult stuff used in these projects is a tool to accent the other things going on in the movie. Let's do the what's in the cup segment really quickly. I've only spilled on camera one time, and last time it was while drinking the passion tea, but in a different cup. Now I've used that cup since and it's been fine, but like a dice that wants to give you low rolls, I just don't want to tempt fate with this tea. So it's really good, let's move on. Also in the exceptions category, some movies are adult because they contain deep political, religious, or other complex themes. Dune is my favorite example of this for these reasons. It's a, it's a deep political thriller that weaves in race and religious themes. It's got a really large cast of characters to keep up with. Generally, it's just more dense than the type of stuff that's aimed at young people or families. I would even say like the recent Jack Ryan show starring Jim Halpert fall into this category. We're chasing down terrorists and exploring geopolitical tensions. It's the kind of subtext that kids aren't going to really get or care about. Now, all that aside, I still find family stories to be the best, but why do they excel where adult stories do not? Well, for one, the themes are much more universal. Like we talked about earlier, most people don't have experience with love triangles, drug addiction, or life-threatening violence. But darn near everybody relates to or aspires to themes of love love and sacrifice, heroism, family struggles, general stress, friendship, gratitude, existential meaning. When you don't have the crutch of spectacle, you have to rely on story and theme and you usually get a better product. This also applies to CGI, which recently has been taking the place of story to disastrous result. As an example, let's talk about the first Narnia book and movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. We'll just talk about that one because because I, I, um, I haven't read the other ones. Okay. We've got multiple themes weaving through this story. Obviously, Aslan is a messianic figure. He is Jesus, the literal lion of Judah. While the savior lion is decidedly Christian, it is wisely left just vague enough to evoke the general idea of a god or a deus ex machina figure that pretty much anybody could enjoy. Aslan represents the higher ideal that both the creatures of the land and the child heroes aspire to. Each of the children responds to their situation and to each other in different ways, but in the end, they all overcome their inner struggle to reach for that higher ideal. You also have sibling archetypes that fit a lot of people, adults that remember their place in a family, what it was like, sometimes carrying that attitude into adulthood. It's a classic good versus evil story with a few hero journeys mixed in, plenty of side characters finding their courage to go fight the evil. All around, it's a great story. No wonder it's a classic. And I don't think you could find a single person who would argue that this is an adult story. C.S. Lewis himself had thoughts on this argument, which is old enough that he had thoughts on it. These include the very popular A Children story that can only be enjoyed by children is not a good children's story in the slightest. And also his quote that one day you'll be old enough to read fairy tales again. He's also got this really great longer quote about growth being the adding of things, not the leaving behind of them. And it ends with him saying, if to drop parcels and to leave stations behind were the essence and virtue of growth, why should we stop at the adult? Why should not senile be equally a term of approval? Why are we not to be congratulated on losing our teeth and hair? Well, I can't top that, so I'm not gonna try. What are some children's stories you've seen with excellent themes? And what are some stories you've seen that are positively juvenile in their need to be all grown up? I appreciate you watching, and I'll see you next time.